I'm Gary O'Reilly. And I'm Chuck Nice. And this is Playing, Playing With, with Science. Science. Life, it seems, is full of mountains. Some we conquer, some we don't. And then for some of us, one is not enough. We have to find more. Yes, that will be seven to be exact. Each the highest mountain on each of the seven continents. And because it's still not enough, some of us have to do it quicker than anyone else before them. Our special guest today is a rock star of the highest order. Vanessa O'Brien is the owner of the Seven Summits World Record, but even that was not enough. She has conquered K2, and this is the scariest set I think I've ever said. The mountain that claims one in four who attempt it. And she has skied the last degree at both poles. No doubt it's just for kicks and giggles. As we know, though, summiting is incredibly dangerous for your health. Yeah, really, no kidding. So, Chuck, if you had to pick, who would be your best mountain guy? I'm going to go with God himself, because oh. that's the only way you will find me on a mountain. It will be a cold day in hell. Oh. No, actually, I want somebody who's a trained physician, especially a medical emergency trained physician with a good bedside manner cool. and who better to be that than dr alan oram who is one of only two currently registered in the usa he will no doubt along with his medical know-how be bringing us insight into high altitude science yes but uh, before we get to the good doctor Let's meet our very special guest, shall we? That said, yes. she is a rock star of the highest order, and you knew exactly what I meant by that. Vanessa O'Brien. Wow. It is so great to have <laughs> you here. Nice to be here. How uh, are you guys? I got to tell you, I'm Explorer a of the year. Explorer of the uh -oh. Year. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, you're just, uh, first of all, so I spent so much time on YouTube watching you and the climb and all the footage of you. And, you know, I have to say that um, it is, a, I was cold and tired, <laughs> exhausted and hurt after watching the video. It is a, it is a monumental undertaking, any summit. So I'm gonna ask you, everybody says K2 is the hardest. So I'm gonna go, completely opposite. What's the easiest? Well, um, so of the seven summits, the easiest is probably Kosciuszko, and that's in Australia. Uh -huh. Australia yes. That's Australia. So that is, um, and, and you mentioned seven summits. So right there, I'll have to hedge and say there's, there's really eight. There's really eight. And that's because there's two sets of seven summits and what I like to call the CYA seven summits. Mm -hmm. So there's a seventh summit choice for the seven summits. Okay. Based on two lists. There's the Bass list and the Mesner list. Okay. The Bass list is based on um, Richard Dick Bass, who was a businessman, who was the first to come up with the concept of the seven summits. He was a layman, looked out at a map of the world, naturally looked and chose, when looking at continents, Australia as the seventh summit, and therefore Kosciuszko, which is 7,310 feet, mm -hmm. not, very, not much larger than Mount Washington. Okay. okay. Mesner, being a mountaineer, looked at Australia and said it would take longer to fly there than to climb it and wouldn't really waste his time. So he developed a notion of Oceania, or Australasia, and therefore chose Kirsten's Pyramid mm -hmm. as the seventh summit. Therefore, the CYA, which you know stands for... Cover your ass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wasn't going to or, say it. <laughs> or, yeah. So, but yes, so if you want to do both lists, you would effectively do eight. Right. So where's, where's Kirsten's Pyramid? That's Western New Guinea, which is Papua. So it's yeah. the old Erie and Jawa. Cool. And they're quite different because that's 16,050 feet. So imagine 7,000, 16,000, and the Mesner list of Carson's Pyramid, he introduced the only rock climbing. Oh, okay. Okay, in the Seven Summit series. So very, very different choice of... Different challenge altogether. Different challenge altogether. So, uh, let's, let's go back to the beginning. Uh, you weren't born a rock climber. You weren't born a mountaineer, I'm guessing. You wake up one morning and say, I'm doing it. Mm. I'm going to be a mountaineer. It's Everest, it's K2, whatever you got, bring it on. Then what happens? You can't just say, I've packed my bag, I'm off, I'll see you in a year. Mm -hmm. How do you yeah. go about the process of preparing, 
because you make your way down to the local playground and start on the monkey bars. I mean, so so really, uh, okay. So there is there is, um, you know, there's book knowledge, right? That we can all gain through research, knowledge, you know, and that's great. Everybody should undertake that. That's for free. Then there is experiential knowledge. You have to go out and do it. You have to make those mistakes. Um, there, there really aren't um, there aren't courses per se in mountaineering, the way you and I might take a course, um, you know, in motor racing or something like that in these in these car schools or something that teach you how to drive. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't really work like that. So the best thing to do is is really just sign up on on for something where you have to go and put on that kit. You have to learn what a harness is. You have to learn what a helmet is. You have to learn what crampons are, how they work, and, you know, just start to use them and start to make those mistakes. So, Not the bad ones. Well, you, you hope that by the time you get into a bad situation, you have accumulated knowledge and experience where you're not going to, you know, blow it or do something too dangerous. So what is the appeal? Once, once you've, I want to say mastered, once you've got a grip, literally, on a lot of the things you need to know, what's the thrill, what's the appeal, what's the drive behind wanting to summit one of these big peaks? Well, I I, I don't know really of of much, I don't know of anything that's that's a harder challenge. It's it's kind of, um, you know, man versus nature. Hmm. Uh, You know, uh, it's, it's, it's much more than physical, it's, it's a mental, um, uh, mental, spiritual, physical, um, uh, it's, it's like everything that could possibly be put on the table is out there with that challenge. There's nothing that I know of uh, that you can do otherwise that can really give you that entire challenge in your life. So there's no, um, there's no assignment at work that you can be given, let's say, that can stimulate you in that, in that same way. Does each mountain teach you something different about you? Uh, yeah, it teaches you something different about you, about uh, your teams, about, um, uh, you know, how you work with others, um, you know, uh, nature. It teaches you something, all sorts of things, you know, that, um, you know, d- depending on your experience and what happens. So when you talk about, uh, okay, so the K2 uh, summit, you are the first woman to successfully summit and by successful, I mean to go up and return, because... Incorrect. No. Oh, really? <laughs> you said first woman. That's not true. I'm the 50th woman and the first American and, and oh, British Oh, I'm sorry. Woman. The first American and British woman. Right. right. Uh, oh, here's, the stat, here's the stat, Chuck. There are more women who've gone to space than have summited K2. Correct. Wow. Three times more. How's that? Does that kind of put things in perspective? That's... That's so, pretty. In, that's pretty incredible. So 150 women have been to space, right? And only 50, only 50 have have actually summited. Me too. Right. And now the so, but there are American women that have come before you that have reached the top, right? No. Never. Never. Okay. So, uh, who who there were two British women who got to the top and died? And, the and they died at the top. Oh. Whew, Which is why I said that one in four. Yep. So, right. so, so that was um, Julie Tullis and Alison Hargraves. Right. And um, so it, it, it does show that, you know, it, it's a very dangerous pursuit mm-hmm. because, it, you know, 85% of deaths happen on the way down. So that's right. not just K2, though. That could be that's, any 8,000 meter peak. We, yeah, I was going to say that. The same, yeah. They say the same thing about Everest as right. well. It's not getting up, it's getting down. Right. That's, that's really the. So Ever- why is that? Why is it that. Because you think that there's, intuitively, mm-hmm. it would seem that there's less energy needed to get down. It would seem that there's less, uh, you, you exert yourself less. I mean, and that's only because all of us have climbed a tree when we were a kid. Yep, yep, yep. And we know how hard it was to get up there. And then, you know, getting down is not the hard part. Okay, so, so we're, why? So we're playing with science. So let's take a step back. Okay. Thank you. Let's go with the air we breathe. Mm-hmm. Take a breath. We're in New York. I'd rather not take a breath. <laughs> <laughs> but we're in the studio. It could be safer. Absolutely. All right. So whether you're on the radio with us now or whether you're in the studio now, 78% of the air we breathe is what? Oxygen. 
No. Pollution. <laughs> it is. It is a gas. It's nitrogen, right? Nitrogen, yeah. correct. Seventy-eight percent of the air we breathe is nitrogen. Twenty-one point nine percent is. I'll give you. A, I'll give you a vowel. <laughs> oxygen. Right. Okay. So that's primarily the two things. The the tr there's trace gases for the rest. It's argon, CO two, everything else. Right. That is the air we breathe. That is the same at sea level as it is on the top of Everest. Mm -hmm. So what changes? Go ahead. Something changes, but it's not the composition of air. Right. What changes is pressure. Okay. So the higher we climb, the lower the atmospheric pressure. Okay. So all, when we're sitting here, there's lots and lots of these molecules. And we, when we take a breath, there's lots of molecules that enter our system. When we're at the top of the mountain, all these molecules are so spread apart. Stretched out. That's why you see a climber take one breath. One molecule comes in. They're huffing and puffing. Another molecule comes in, huffing and puffing. Mm -hmm. It's more painful than watching golf. So it's funny because what you just said there and it's, is really fascinating because most people say when you climb a mountain, there's no oxygen up there. Into that's, thin air. That's what every, into thin air. There's no oxygen up there. But you're saying the mixture is the same. The mixture's the same. The reason it's thin air is because the pressure, pressure is pushing spreading it out. molecules apart. Gotcha. And therefore... It's the, the composition's the same. It's just that these molecules are now so... Your so body's working harder to bring that in. It, well, it's, yeah, and you're, it's, you're under exertion, of course. Right. But here, you know, if I were to draw, like, all these molecules, like, really close together, now pressure spread them all apart. You're just not getting... Right, you're not getting it. You're yeah. not getting it. Wow. So, now, what does the body do? Because the body's very clever. You're going higher, and it's sensing you don't have what you need. Mm -hmm. The oxygen tank out. No, it's building red blood cells. Mm -hmm. Oh, so it goes into an automatic defense mechanism. Hemoglobin starts producing more and more red blood cells naturally. Gotcha. Now, where have we heard this before? Blood blank. Doping? Yes. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Blood doping. Did you go there straight away? <laughs> now. Because you know how I feel about exactly. doping. Exactly. <laughs> so it's free, it's natural, and right. it's necessary. Right. We're getting this EPO, which is, you know, completely natural. It's stimulated by the kidneys. This is something that mountaineers are getting as we climb higher. Mm -hmm. Naturally stimulated, and this is what we're getting, is the, the, the nice red blood cells to help us with this oxygen deprivation. Okay. The problem is that this thick oxygen that's now in our blood system is really, really thick and puts us at twice the risk for a heart attack and stroke. Gotcha. Okay, it's something good, but there's a shadow, and that shadow is that thickness, right? So we work really, 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 really hard to get to the top, give all this energy to get there. And, and people will say, hey, you know, sometimes people burn all that, you know, energy to get there, and they don't leave that reserve. So when that 85% statistic comes in, they've given everything thinking that the summit is the goal. The summit is never the goal. Right. It's round trip return round trip return got right? yeah no no because there's no sense. point we, we're programmed we're pre-programmed to get to the top of the mountain that's it end of story but that's never the goal the goal is return trip round trip return Obviously, because yeah. and hillary that you know sir and hillary fought this for years you know unless you returned there was no point there was no point because there was no one to tell the tale we will take a break now, uh, but don't panic. Vanessa O'Brien will still be with us after this break. Welcome back. You're listening to Playing With Science, and this is our very special mountaineering show. And we are honored to have the extraordinary Vanessa O'Brien as our special guest. Now, just before the break, we got stuck into what it takes to be a top mountaineer. Even before you get to base camp. You've got to not only prepare yourself, but as a team leader, as you were and are, mm. past tense, present tense, how do you select your team? What are the key factors for you strategizing to build a team that you know will successfully summit and come back again? So I have never been fortunate enough to select a team uh -huh. because uh, of funding. 
in most cases, their sponsorship does not really exist in high altitude mountaineering. That makes sense. Because it is deemed too high risk. Of course. I mean, listen, think about it. Think about it. I'm um, I'm uh, Nissan, right? And I want to sponsor your team. And I make a big to-do out of it. And then you freaking die. I, I just wasted a lot of money because I can't say a word to anybody. But think about it also. There's, there's no better way to get that message being number one, getting to the top, the hard work that goes into, right. you know, driven to explore, which happened to be one of Mercedes sponsorships at a mountain. Right. You know, is I'm putting my brand, yep. hard earned brand loyalty, brand value 100%. up there and I'm, I'm rolling a dime. No, no. Yeah, but it's a big risk, but it's a big payoff. Oh, it's too. a big, big payoff. And that's the point. Risk and reward payoff, right? The higher the risk, the higher the reward. Absolutely. You know, however, people never talk about mitigating risk. Okay. So here's how you would mitigate the risk is what you publish and when you publish it. You would capture everything. Of course you would. But if you were really risk averse, you wouldn't publish a single thing until that expedition was finished. Right. And then everything would go into production. Right. If you were very risk averse. Right. Huh? You would never not capture it. Of course. If you weren't risk averse, like I had a, a, a play with credit cards where every camp you would pick, you know, pick a name and pay off a credit card bill, let's say. How fun, because you get your entire, you know, customer base involved, let's say. Mm -hmm. Now, something like that can be very consumer driven and a lot of fun. But now you're 100 percent vested and engaged. So you are open to taking the risk with the consumer. Did you guess that Vanessa has a background in finance? <laughs> <laughs> now, OK, but, but, but putting all that stuff aside. OK. Now, the, the problem with, uh, you know, these expeditions is it, there is one of economics, Right. So it, it, it takes X number of people to make a trip economically feasible. Okay. So what I mean by that is in choosing a team, it tends, without sponsorship, it tends to be the number of people looking to go. Right. And so people tend to be put together who have similar, uh, you know, like-minded goals and, you know, want to do similar things. Do they have to go through psychological testing and profiling? before they get onto a team? No, it's nothing like that. No, no okay. No, I mean, it's... So what are the credentials that are necessary? Like, for instance, there, if I just showed up, I was like, hey, so you guys climbing a day? Like, that's... Well, you can't do that. No, right? I mean... You, you would have to have some credentials. To, to, to get on a permit in either Nepal or Pakistan, this is the Karakoram and the Himalayas, you, you would have to have some climbing experience. So they are looking for every permit that they issue that every member has you know, at least climbed an 8,000 meter peak, let's say, if you're going to an 8,000 meter peak. Okay. Um, you know, this doesn't apply for the cooks or the base camp staff because they're just going to be walking, you know. Right. That's where they're kilometers. staying. They're staying yeah. there. Okay, so now let me ask you this. What, uh, can you give us, when we think of teams, of course, this is a sports show, sports mm -hmm. science show, but still sports. When we think of teams, we think of positions. OK, and like, you know, in football, you have a quarterback, you have a wide receiver and you have a lineman. OK, in soccer, yeah, yeah, you have yeah, a striker, yeah. you have a forward. Here, so yeah. now when your team, do you have positions and what are they responsible for? What do you guys what how do you divvy up the uh, responsibilities? Yeah, I mean, and what are the responsibilities? No, I mean, we, we do. Um, so, you know, if, if the team has Sherpa or high altitude porters, uh, those those team members tend to go out um, and investigate the route, uh, put in some of the fixed lines um, uh, before, say, uh, team members go up to, you know, in advance of team members setting up camp. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's because some of the, some of the, there are some bottlenecks in some of these areas. So Hillary Step is a good one on Everest. Right. Um, there's Houses Chimney and, and the Black Pyramid uh, right. on K2. What's, it sounds like a Harry Potter book. <laughs> it is, I know. So when you say bottleneck, this is like extremely narrow passages, right? And so I saw in your video at one point, there was like a single person passage that you were going through and you were all in a single file. It looked absolutely terrifying it was not just climbing like like your mountain climbing but it was also like rock climbing while you were mountain climbing do can do you know what that is would you be able to tell me where that was it could be one of two three things okay. i mean so sometimes on uh and and this does get a little bit into to climate a little bit so uh 
with climate change, a lot of these, so if you look at a mountain in, at a distance, right. it looks like it's full of snow. Right. <laughs> but when you're, when you're actually on it, mm-hmm. it's full of rock. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, over the years uh, with, with climate change, and I would prefer that word over, say, global warming, right. uh, these mountains are so high. Uh, how high are they? So let's talk about that. This, this is, uh, you know, let's say 8,000, 9,000 meters or 26 uh, to 29,000 feet. This is at the very, very top of the troposphere. All weather, all weather takes place here and below. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when you have these um, jet streams pounding on these mountains at 200, 300 miles an hour, first of all, all the snow is just getting ripped off. You've also got all these, you know, uh, really, really hot weather, sun baking on these mountains, melting all the snow and ice. So increasingly with, you know, the climate change that's happening, you've got less and less snow and ice. When I talk to the old mountaineers from the 60s and 70s who are still alive, they simply say, thank God I'm not climbing this stuff now. Because I, I was wearing crampons and I had ice and snow. I, I have to wear crampons and I'm often having to wear crampons on rock, which is the wrong tool for the job. Gotcha. But I can't switch footwear. Oh, crap. Yeah, big crap. It's probably not what she said. <laughs> Tell me, you did, you, you're far too polite to say things nice. like that. Halfway up a minute. Oh, dang. <laughs> so, I mean, what are you two? Okay. So, 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 you know, really to, to answer your question, it's just, it's very, very hard when there's a lot of rock and you're in these single file positions because the traffic is the same way up as it is down. Oh. So, and, and if you're at a really high altitude, you are, you are stuck. If somebody's taking an hour to get up there, you're an hour behind them. Oh, we, to, what, what we are learning, well, I am, most certainly, is that I never want to do this. But that we knew. <laughs> um, and I might not be far behind you. Over the course of decades, mountains have changed they because don't, of yeah. the, the, the climate change. But I guess from a day-to-day basis, this thing almost has its own life force and the mountain you start climbing uh, at the beginning of the day isn't the mountain halfway through the day or at the end of the day Not at all. how on earth do you plan for hour to hour to deal with basically what is a living rock uh well this is a big deal on everest everest uh, has that kumbu uh, icefall which is the first thing out of base camp so it's a three thousand foot shifting maze of you know glacial ice that is constantly shifting and moving so it becomes very dangerous wow. one to get through it because how many people you know, turn around to go off oh, that's it then forget it well you know there's there's been people 16 people killed in one day if, yeah. if, if yeah. you know towering oh. ciroc's come yeah. down and you yeah. know, get right on top of them so it's probably the most dangerous part of, of the whole mountain, actually, is right at the beginning. Yeah. Um, so that's, that. you know, the, each mountain has its little idiosyncrasies. Um, now, funny enough, Everest this year had the highest number of summits ever on, on the record of history. In mm. 20, 2018, it had 700 summits. Um, it surpassed 2013, I think, was the previous record. So... Almost sounds like there's a rush hour. Well, it, it, seven hundred is a lot. Yeah, a yeah. lot of people in it's one. A lot of people. A lot of, lot of people in one season. I've, I've seen the um, actual pictures of that, where it looks like the people are lined up in a conga line going up. Yeah. And uh, I, I say it's because you know in Nepal they have this, uh, you know, this Sherpa community yep. that um, they are so good at uh, being able to take people up. Yep. And they, by the way have the highest risk involved yep. because they're always going before. Yep. And as a result, they are the most susceptible to avalanche. Yep. And you have a great many of the people in the community who are dying uh, so that tourists can actually go up Everest, you know. Yep. Now, uh, I believe last year, the year before, they now allow equipment to be helicoptered up to Camp 1 so the Sherpa are not taking that equipment. Thank God. So there's there's a change that will have environmental effects though because you know I don't know that a helicopter it's probably helicopters don't belong up there yeah but you know just I mean really what should happen is and it's a shame that it's become such a part of their economy yep. but what should happen is we shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. people like you should be doing this people like me who want to go to a cocktail party and talk about it shouldn't be doing this like mountaineers i don't mind uh you know certain other people who are doing it for research mm. people who are doing it to write about it like purposeful 
uh, uh, summiting, which I'll call it that, makes sense to me. But well, you know, a mountaineer starts somewhere. So I think it depends what your what your purpose is in wanting to do it, right? So, right. you know, if, if somebody is, wants to really train hard and, you know, do it the right way, you know... I, I don't have a problem with that. I don't I, have a problem no, with that. No, because you're making the commitment. That's yeah. what I'm saying. It's, it's like if you're making the commitment. I'm talking about somebody who just... You know, like who wants to say I did it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to do it just so as they can tell a story. Yeah, so they can yeah. tell a story at a cocktail party. I if think it's, yeah. I'm a little, I'm a little, I'm, I got a little problem with that. If it's that's on all a I'm bucket saying. list, then that's not a uh, that's right. not cool. Gosh, yeah, there's no doubt about that. Well, we got to take a break, we but, have. but but you're going to stay with us, right? Absolutely. And Thank I got to read you this quote when we come back. I just want to get your. It's a. Do you know this French alpinist? His name is uh, Gaston Repouva. <laughs> uh, and, uh, wait, our, our, no our, our producer is no way near. That's the, the our, our producer is French. Uh, uh, Johnny, is it Gaston Rebouffa? Uh, Clusi- he went like this: Clusinev Rebouffa. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. So anyway, he says this. So hates you right <laughs> really hates you. All right. So this is what uh, this is what he said. Um, Mountains provide a mirror of stone and ice, a mirror which helps us know ourselves. Reaching a mountain summit requires that we confront the reflection we find in the stone mirror, working with all that is weak, lazy, and fearful within ourselves. Mm. Do you agree with that? I think that's a great quote. Um, I know one I always go back to is Reinhold Mesner, who says, Mountains aren't fair or unfair, they're just dangerous. Ooh, I like that. I have several girlfriends. (laughs) Fit that description. <laughs> well, you can substitute girlfriends for mountains then. Oh, I already have. <laughs> and, and if Mrs. Nice is listening. Uh, Are you kidding me? Mrs. Nice was the last one. <laughs> oh. Gary's going to oh. keep his mouth shut. All right, let's take that break. Vanessa O'Brien, the fabulous Vanessa O'Brien, will be with us and we'll be speaking to one of only two registered mountaineering guides who is a qualified physician. Dr. Alan Oram, that's all when we get back. Welcome back to Playing With Science. As you will be more than aware, if you've been listening from the beginning, we do hope you are, uh, Vanessa O'Brien. Um, the lady who summited the seven summits faster than anyone else in the world, a Guinness, a Guinness world, world, world record, record holder. holder is with us and still with us, but now we are honored to have Dr. Alan Oram on the show. Uh, One of only two registered mountaineering guides. In the US. In the US of A, that is a registered physician, and in particular, emergency. Emergency medicine physician. Yeah, so doctor, welcome to Playing With Science. Sir, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. If you are actually on a mountain with a team, what is the most common sort of predicament or problem that you face as far as you're concerned? Um, I think, I mean, I, I uh, help people with a variety of things. I think at altitude, uh, the, the problems that uh, most climbers experience uh, do have to do with altitude. Uh, some are obvious, some are less so. Um, injuries, I think, are pretty obvious. But the question about high altitude illness is I think probably the more common thing that I get uh, calls about, or mm-hmm. often it may just be a text through uh, satellite uh, uh, technology. But uh, altitude, I think, is probably the most common issue that I have to deal with. So with altitude, is that uh, the AMS, this acute mountain sickness, or is that something different? Uh, acute mountain sickness is, is uh, one of the um, common uh, forms of uh, altitude illness. There's also high altitude cerebral edema, and high altitude pulmonary edema. Mm-hmm. Uh, acute mountain sickness is more common, um, but uh, you don't, you wouldn't die from AMS. Uh, uh, high altitude pulmonary edema, it would be the thing that would really kind of do you in, as well as haste or cerebral edema. Vanessa, I mean, you've been there <clears throat> on a number of occasions. How do you? self-manage yourself do you say no 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 it's not a problem i can get through this or do you have to go i need to i need to deal with this now if you get this acute mountain sickness if you get these conditions how how do you deal with these well 
Well, I think, um, if, first of all, in the high altitude medical kits, we, we do carry medicines. So things like dexamethasone, uh, nifedipine, uh, azetazolamide, or diamox. Um, you know, th these are all uh, tools in the toolkit, if you will, um, for uh, emergencies if they occur. Um, uh, Hopefully you don't have to use them, but they're there if you need them. You know, you have to remember in, in many cases in the, in the Himalayas of the Karakoram, we're, we're miles and miles, away, 300 miles from, you know, the closest hospital. Mm -hmm. And there is no helicopter rescue in, you know, in places like Pakistan. You know, they mm -hmm. don't have uh, helicopters for, hi for hire, for example. They're fighting wars. You know, there, there's yeah. other uses for helicopters there. Right. So, you know, we have to be self-sufficient with the, with the medicine. So, um, and, and believe it or not, uh, there is other medicine like Viagra, which uh, may sound funny to you, but... Uh, oh, no, I've heard of that being used. <laughs> but that's, a, altitude, it's, yeah. you know, it's a vasodilator. Yes. And, um, you know, it, it's important because... Um, it's because not, you, you never know when things might get sexy on a mountain. <laughs> Just oh. saying. Oh, dear. No, 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 no. Good no. time on the mountain. Nope, there's never, there's never that. Trust me, people don't take... <laughs> You're people, getting voted off the mountain. People don't take showers and... Uh, uh, this is this is not uh, a sexy time. This no is no sexy time on the mountain. This sexy time. Okay. Uh, this Go ahead. Is so, doctor. A but a vasodilator, by the way, actually increases blood flow. So that right. can be very important, especially when you're in a high altitude uh, uh, um, scenario. But go right. ahead. No. So the doctor, you know, can take it from there. But you, you, we need all those things because if the emergencies um, rise, then you know. We, we have them for if and when they occur. So, Doc, let me ask you this. When it comes to injuries, um, falling, I would say, is something that you don't want to do while you're climbing. But. but people fall and they injure themselves. So now that we're talking about these type of uh, illnesses that can beset a person at these altitudes, these kind of altitude sicknesses, does one precipitate the other? Does the person get sick and they fall? Is is that the, is that a common occurrence that the altitude sickness actually causes a person to fall? Uh, or like like when somebody breaks a hip, it's normally your hip broke and then you fell. People think you broke a hip because you fell. Normally, it's your hip broke and made you fall. So which which one is more common? Is it just human error that causes a person to fall, or illness causes the person to fall? I would say it's probably human error and movement okay. or the uh, lack of ability to pe for people to move in a uh, smooth fashion. Generally, uh, at least on the bigger 8,000-meter peaks, um, a lot of those routes have fixed lines, so you're always attached to a rope, but sometimes you're not, and you can certainly fall and injure yourself. Does one lead to the other? Um, I, th I certainly think that fatigue and um, uh having headaches and AMS symptoms certainly can contribute. Um, but uh, I'm not so sure that there's, you know, one always begets the other. I okay. think just simply falling with, uh, because you can't move very well because of fatigue, uh, elevation, crampons, uh, icy sur surfaces. I think all those things contribute. Cool. Okay. Okay. Well, well, while your pair of you are here, I, Firstly, hypoxia, if you can explain, doctor, exactly what that is, and then sort of, sort of mine the fact of what is the science and the physiology behind this condition. So as I understand, as well as any of our listeners who don't already know. Hypoxia is the, the uh, lack of oxygen uh, delivered to the, to the body, whether that's uh, through something central or peripheral. And so in high altitude illness, when we, when we gain altitude, there's less available oxygen because of the um, because of the low pressure, uh, such that uh, you're not breathing the normal amount of oxygen that you normally would, say at sea level. The effect of that is that your body has to work harder to do the work that it normally would have to do um, at altitude. And so the things that that happen with hypoxia, uh, at least to the body, um, are a combination of problems such as AMS, which can lead to cerebral edema. And then uh, pulmonary edema as well, which is uh, a type of uh, uh, edema that's related to hypoxia and elevated pressures in the uh, pulmonary vessels in the heart. So if you're the guide on, an, on a summit and you are obviously looking after your own self-interests, but you have a duty to the people you have with you, how difficult is it for you 
as a mountaineer and a doctor to manage those things in the best way? Um, that's a good question. I think that um, uh, as a guide, um, I think you have to be uh, uh, very aware of how you feel and how you're performing uh, at altitude. And it, the responsibility is to make sure that uh, you, your safety is paramount. If you're not safe, your clients aren't safe. Hmm. And so uh, taking care of yourself either through medication or decision making, which may mean going down, um, may be prudent. And uh, I think that's a tough thing, especially with ego, yeah. um, the finances, et cetera, uh, to make that decision. As a physician, um, I think I, I tend to um, be very conservative when I'm climbing and I will uh, tend to uh, pull back before I go uh, forward if I'm not feeling right, if mm. my uh, decision making and performance is off, um, I'm going to pay attention to that because of the safety of both myself and the team. Interesting. Mm, Thank interesting. you for that. Um, so I'm, but, but before uh, you go on a, a, a climb, you, you ha can you talk to us about the medical condition that a person wants to be in before they even attempt something like this? I mean, I would assume that there's a good and bad candidate for, for, for climbing. And what makes you what makes you a bad candidate looking like you and I <laughs> well I'm, believe me if you put if you put my face up to bad candidate I will not be uh, disappointed or yeah. offended <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, that too is an, is an excellent question and one that we I face frequently maybe not at, at very very high altitude but where I work here in the Tetons um, it's uh, I think people's perception of what they are about to do or what they want to do is different than reality, uh, meaning that people uh, people's fitness is definitely not always the best. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I think that when people come into these situations, they really have to decide: are they going to train or not? And it shouldn't be just a you know a simple decision. It, it takes work. I'm sure Vanessa trained hard for all those uh, all the peaks she did. Mm -hmm. um, Success is paramount to fitness. And, wow. And, uh, okay, Vanessa, so is there fit and then is there mountain fit? And how, how do you get from one to the other? Yeah, how do you train? So it, it depends what I'm doing. So um, I think 8,000 meters is a little bit different because to me that's, um, that's really about VO2 max and it's about um, the utilization of oxygen. Mm -hmm. So the best training for high altitude is, is really cardiovascular. Um, putting on muscle, a, a lot of muscle, will, will work against me. And what I mean by that is when oxygen is a limited resource, mm -hmm. the brain and the lungs must have that and muscle will compete right. for that. Right. So. I, I need to have the, the highest VO2 max I can possibly achieve and be the most cardiovascular fit. If I put on, if I become Mr. Atlas or Schwarzenegger or something like that, I'm going to fail. I can't that, get up the mountain. <laughs> well, that muscle will, that muscle will compete for the oxygen <laughs> Where did I don't that come have. from? Get to the mountain. <laughs> So, go ahead. Sorry, people. Yeah. Um, so, so, but now if I'm pulling sleds and I'm going to the North Pole, mm. I need muscle, yes. and I'm not climbing very high, so I'm training very, very differently for that. Is it also that. to do with weight? Interesting. Because Interesting. You've, got to, you've got to haul that extra weight, albeit muscle, Well, you're not, you're where not, if you're sledding, you're going horizontally, it's, more or less. It's very deceiving. When you're climbing really, really high altitude, you are not carrying a lot of weight, not as much weight as you think you are. Mm -hmm. um, you're carrying enough, you know, for, from that final camp, let's say, mm -hmm. you know, whatever camp you end up at and there's let's say it's four to summit you know you if you're with oxygen you know oxygen might weigh you know 10 pounds something like that uh you've got maybe two water bottles maybe a thermos change of clothes you're not carrying as much weight as you think you are mm -hmm. um so you know but but if you're pulling sleds, you are carrying What's the hardest a lot part of weight. for you to to get to a condition where you felt in control and comfortable. Well, well, let me put it another way. You you must show up in your best your best fitness self right. on any any endeavor, mm -hmm. which which means you know um, that you have strength, 
that you have flexibility, you have good, um, you know, uh, um, a good core, mm -hmm. because you know you're not going to have a good balance in, in many occasions. Mm -hmm. So you must you must show up as your best fitness self. Wow. But but you should understand what you're undertaking and the difference in training for that. So that's the physicality. You don't just climb with your body. Surely you must engage a mental process. And not just, I'm seeing, I'm doing it. But, and the doctor can probably attest this, and he may have touched on it already. If I'm a complete nutcase, and I turn up and say, I'm going to go and do this mountain thing, you know my mentality is nowhere near where it should be. Is it the kind of, I've got to dial everything down and be calm, be thoughtful, or do you have to have a different or a slightly, well, yeah, a different approach than that? So, so fear plays an, an important role. Um, you know, it, it's an obvious mechanism that tells you something is wrong and, you know, kicks in when it needs to kick in. But it can also, it can also be a devil's advocate and, and do the, a wrong thing, too. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I've seen people use fear as an excuse, too. And, you know, some of these, expedi some of these expeditions are six to eight weeks. Right. Uh -huh. This is a long time. Yes. So people start to psych themselves out. They start to see like bad weather. They start to see like avalanches. They start to like remember, you know, hey. How do you control that? Because you can't control this, the weather systems. You can't control how the mountain's going to behave that day. So the thing you can control is what goes off in here. Yeah, you, you've got to have, you know, a really strong focus and a mental, you know, um, you know, mental fortitude that, that keeps your focus, you know, uh, where it should be, which is, you know, on, on the objective. Um, now, weather is, is just a wild card. So, mm -hmm. you know, that reading is all over the place. But, but I've seen people, you know, start to spread fear about, you know, the weather looks bad and it keeps looking bad and there'll be no summit. And, you know, they start to talk themselves out of a summit almost. Okay. And they start to remember an anniversary back home and how they got to get home. And then they start to develop illnesses. And suddenly, like, you know, their head's not here. Yeah. And when their head's not here, they're not here. So, so Doc, they're going home. When speaking of fear, so part of your training as a doctor is, you know, a... I guess they call it a bedside manner, but it's really psychology. If you think about it, it's like it's pretty much getting into a patient's head and then allowing them to let you do your job. So, uh, do you how much of that do you use when you're when you're guiding someone or or instructing or helping someone on a tour? How much of that do you actually use when when it comes to uh, what, what Vanessa was talking about? People who might psych themselves out or or get afraid or freak out or something like that. Uh, I, a ton. A ton. I think most of what we do is, is Just coaching. A <laughs> Bucket load, a large amount. Um, I think uh, motivation and, and uh, addressing fear is 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 fundamental to what people um, have to face. And you know, the physical part of it you can you can manage. Um, the mental part of it is uh, something that's it's you have to kind of coax people into believing in themselves and finding that calm and, and translating that to, uh, to success. Right. And, uh, I, I think that it probably represents most of what we do as, as guide, as a guide, um, uh, to get people to their objective and to enjoy where they are. Um, and, you know, not just objective, but process. And, you know, the, the whole, the whole trip is, is kind of more important to me than just the summit. Yeah. And I trying to relate that to people is really, really difficult. Um, and when you can get through it and people uh, identify their fear and, um, and their weaknesses and they, they overcome that, they're hugely successful. So uh, Doctor, before okay. you go, um, as a physician, uh, and Vanessa has given me the impression that every time she's summited, she's learned something, she's faced something different. Have you approached it in a similar way? Has high altitude mountaineering taught you any medical lessons have you found things that you probably wouldn't have found said had you stayed closer to sea level well sure i mean it's it's like any uh any experience the more you, the more experience you have in, in a variety of settings the more knowledge you gain um you know tra either traveling at a high altitude or, or dealing with folks who who have illnesses at high altitude it just it just creates a whole different uh, avenue for uh, for learning and I mean, I'm always shocked at what I see and hear from people. 
like mm-hmm. all the time. And uh, it's kind of never ending. So let me ask both of you this. This will be my last question. Uh, okay. So you, you, you both are e- extraordinarily passionate about this. It's, mm-hmm. it's evident. Okay. And you're both proficient. And what I'd like to know is what can you tell me from your perspective? Why should anybody do this? Go ahead, Vanessa. Knock yourself out. <laughs> this is where you say ladies first, right? <laughs> uh, why, so. why should anybody do this? Um, so I think, uh, well, first of all, I, I never really advocate doing this per se. I, I like using mountaineering as a metaphor more than anything else. Okay. Um, but in terms of taking one more step, but I, I do think people should get outside of their comfort zone. Um be, and have more self-belief knowing that they always have a safety net. Um, the safety net is all the knowledge, skills, and experience that they've ever acquired in life that can actually help them pivot and do something different because you can always go back. But what, what lies ahead is unknown. So taking that knowledge, skills, and experience allows you to pivot, take that, you know, not, not that much risk that you think it is, because you can always go back, but trying something different, you never know what you'll discover. You're up next, Doc. Doc? <laughs> That's a hard one to beat. I know. Yeah, <laughs> Doc's like, what she said. <laughs> no, go um, ahead, Doc. Go ahead. Go ahead. Why, yeah, why should anyone do this? Uh, well, I think that um, if we internalize it and ask ourselves why we do it, um, th- this, is a, this is what I've done for my, almost my entire life. And I'm passionate about it. My uh, my life revolves around being in the mountains. And when you come to it as an older adult or just even as a an adult, why? Um, I think people come from come to it from all different directions. One one is a is a challenge. Um, and I think I see a lot of people who just they just want to experience something different. Uh, that that comfort zone that we uh, live in. Um, does need to be challenged, I, I think, and um, the mountains are definitely one way to challenge it. Um, to step out of your comfort zone into into the box that you've never stepped into before, it's super valuable as uh, as a growing process, as a tool. Um, being in places that are just absolutely stunning and uh, locations you can, you'll never go to again, probably. Some of us make our living in, in those environments, and and they're super valuable. Uh, to me, it's 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 how I live my life and how I'd like like others to live their lives too, uh, in touch with uh, with their surroundings and uh, and engaging. Doctor, right. thank you. Very and cool, Vanessa. I mean, thank it's you. fabulous to have the pair of you on at the same time. Yeah, Doctor Alororum, thank you so much for your time, Vanessa O'Brien, uh, a superstar of the world's mountains. Uh, that's it, Chuck. Are we out of show? We are done. We dude. have. I believe we have summited. We have. <laughs> The big, that's the easy bit, apparently. Yes, and now we got to get down. That won't happen on camera. And then what will happen is I'll die of a heart attack at the top of this mountain. Okay? Everybody else Nightful. will descend. And then they have to leave me up here because you can't take your dad with you. He's got <laughs> such a complex. You ain't going to die up there, bro. There All right. Go. Thank yeah. you, Doc. Thank you. That famous bedside manner just got brought See, forward. See, that's why he's a guy. He's encouraging that's me it. even now. He's there like, you go. you're not going to die. You're not going to die up here, bro. You're not going to die. Come out to the team. Tetons will get you up the Grand Teton, buddy. All right, you got it. <laughs> All right. Meanwhile, on Magic Mountain, right? <laughs> if this show has inspired you, I am a happy person because yes. these two people have been awesome. Uh, right, I've been Gary O'Reilly. Who are you? I'm, 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 I'm still Chuck Nice. Yes, he is. I can Firmly on the that. ground, Chuck Nice. Yes. And this has been Playing With Science, and we'll catch you very, very soon, I'm sure.